Good morning, Real Life Church. So glad to have you with us in your homes. If you'd please uh, join with us as we worship our Lord together this morning. He's worthy.
see that victory this morning. And you need to believe those lines there that say you take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good. You're in that place right now this morning where you need that to be so true in your life for what is happening, for what's going on. You, you're like, God, you need to do something about this. And so we just need to make that declaration this morning that he is going to take our mess. Um, whatever it is that's going on, he's going to take what the enemy has meant for evil. He's going to turn that's it around. Right. Because that's who he is. Yeah. It's about bringing redemption. It's about the goodness of God. So that we can see him fully as he is. As we sing that this morning... Let's just declare it with everything that you have inside you. Uh, just proclaim that truth, that that's what he's going to do in your life, despite what's going on, despite the mess, that God's going to take that and he's going to turn it around. In Jesus' name. Thank you. You take what the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good. You turn it
walk to wherever I was going to go to. And I didn't necessarily know where that was going to be because I didn't have a place.
It is always so great being in the presence of God with people who love worshiping Jesus. And I know that's you because I've seen how you worship. You're just crazy about Jesus. And you know what? I am too. I love worshiping the Lord with you. Welcome to Real Life Online. My name is Tim Versalono. I'm the lead pastor here at Real Life Church in Laconia. We've been in a series for the past number of weeks simply called Acts. And we've been looking at the time from Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection leading up to his ascension and the day of Pentecost. And now the day of Pentecost has happened and we're going past that a little bit, remaining in the book of Acts. Last week we were in a... We were, uh, I brought the message, it was called Looking for Jesus. Today is going to be Looking for Jesus Part 2. Looking for Jesus Part 2. And so would you turn in your Bible with me to the book of Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10. And we're going to be going all the way to the back of the chapter, right before chapter 11. Acts chapter 10. If you're worshiping uh, with us online, again, I just want to say, as you're turning in the word, thank you for your continued faithful giving. God continues to do great things in our lives. And I just want to give you a quick, a quick update, a quick praise report. And, uh, back in February, remember we talked about raising the funds for purchasing our chairs. It was a little bit under $12,000. And I'm happy to report to you, church, that all total... That uh, all total, we have received over twenty-two thousand six hundred dollars for the chairs. So we received over ten thousand dollars above and beyond, and so that has been. Uh, so first off, would you thank the Lord with me? Thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness. Thank you, God, for your faithfulness that you continue to provide for us in Jesus' name. So. So we've got other projects that we're working on. We'll tell you more about that. But I had to share that great news with you because I knew you'd want to rejoice with me in the faithfulness of God. So thank you very much. Acts chapter 10 is where we're at. Acts chapter 10. We're going to begin reading verse 44. And it reads this way. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came down on all those who heard the message. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on even the Gentiles. For they heard them speaking in other tongues and declaring the greatness of God. Then Peter responded, Can anyone withhold water and prevent these people from being baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? He commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked him to stay for a few days. Lord, we thank you for your word. I pray as we are in your word today that you would communicate to us and through us. Holy Spirit, let my words be your words and let your words be my words. Transform us and change us in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. So as we continue on in this passage here in, book, in the book of Acts chapter 10, it is very clear to me as people of the kingdom of God that God has ordained the church to be a church that is alive with the power of the Holy Spirit. God wants us as the church to be alive. He wants us to be alive. And see, God has ordained our church, not just the church, but real life family. I believe God has ordained our church to be a church that is alive with the power of the Holy Spirit. I don't just want to be a nice gathering, a nice collection of people, and we have a good time whenever we get together, and oh, we feel just great. God has ordained you and he's ordained me to be filled with the power of the Holy Spirit, to be a true representation of the kingdom of God as the church of the living God. And it's sad, but so many churches have allowed themselves through whatever course of their life cycle to become deficient when it comes to living in the fullness of the power of God. And God wants us to be full of his power, full of the power of the Holy Spirit. So I'd like to take some time today as we're in the Word together and unpack Acts chapter 10 a little bit further, a little bit more deeply, because I think there's some things that I think that God wants to communicate, communicate to us. So we're going to get right to it. Number one, God the Holy Spirit is very alive and well. God the Holy Spirit is very alive and well. Now, there's a reason why I, I, this is our first point today, because I want to establish kind of a foundation, because I've been hearing some, some talk and some conversation recently where people refer to the Holy Spirit as an it. Let me just correct that right now. The Holy Spirit is a he. He is a person. The Holy Spirit is not an it, because we tend to think in our society, spirit kind of, and we're going to look at some passages here in the Bible. So verse 44, we just read a few minutes ago. 
It says this. It says, while Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came down on all those who heard the message. So the Holy Spirit is not an it. The Holy Spirit is a person. The Holy Spirit is a person. What does he do? Because there's things of personhood that define us as people. There's things that define Tim Versalono. So I'm not just a spirit, even though I've been born again. I have a body and I have a soul. But I am a person. I am made in the image and the likeness of God. We as people are made in the image and likeness of God. So what does the Holy Spirit do? Well, John chapter 16, verses 13 through 15 tell us this. It says, he leads people to Jesus. He leads people to Jesus. However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. He will glorify me. This is Jesus speaking. The Holy Spirit will glorify me, for he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. Now watch this, verse 15. All things the Father has are mine. Therefore, I said that he will take care of mine and declare it to you. So what are some things that Jesus is? Well, verse, uh, we see that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And Jesus tells us here in verse 13, he says, when the spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all truth. He's not going to guide you into your truth. He guides you into the truth. And the truth is that Jesus Christ is Lord. There are many people that say, you know, you can take this way to spirituality. You can take that way to spirituality. You can, this, you can do this to be spiritually enlightened. And Jesus is very clear. He says, I'm it. If you want true spiritual enlightenment, the only way to come to God is through me. And the Holy Spirit makes that way available for you to come through me. And then I point you to the Father. And that's what Jesus is telling here in John chapter 16. The Holy Spirit will guide us into all truth. And he doesn't speak on his own authority. So the Holy Spirit has authority. And he doesn't speak on his own authority, but he speaks on what he hears. And what he hears, he speaks to us. That's what the word tells us here in John chapter 16. The Holy Spirit will speak to us. So when you begin to listen and discern and hear the voice of God, you're hearing the, the voice of God, the Holy Spirit, speaking what Jesus, the truth of who Jesus is to you, and what Jesus has, God has given him, because Jesus said that right here. He will take of what is mine and declare it to you, verse 14, and all things that the Father has are mine. Everything God has belongs to Jesus, and the Holy Spirit declares that to us. And he does that. When he does, it glorifies Jesus, and the Holy Spirit distributes what God has through Jesus to us. Let me say that again. The Holy, the Holy Spirit distributes what God has through Jesus to us. That is what the Holy Spirit does. The Holy Spirit is a person. He's not an it. Here's, here's what else the Holy Spirit is. He's the one who indwells and empowers us, according to Acts chapter 2, verse 4. We've been looking in recent days at the day of Pentecost and this experience that God has for us. And, and we mentioned last week, it is the birthright of every believer to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Now, not every believer is baptized with the Holy Spirit. But it is the right of every believer because Jesus made a way for that to happen for us as believers in Jesus Christ. He is the one who indwells and empowers us. What else about the Holy Spirit? Look at this. Romans chapter 8 verse 11 says the same Holy Spirit, the Spirit who raised Jesus from the dead, if he lives inside of us, which he does, then he is bringing life to our body. The Holy Spirit not only indwells us with power, but he empowers us with explosive kingdom of God power. Think about that with me for just a second. The Holy Spirit raised Jesus from the dead. And Romans chapter 8 verse 11 tells us, if the same Holy Spirit who raised Jesus from the dead lives inside of us, he brings life into our bodies. That is explosive, heavenly power. That is what the Holy Spirit does. He indwells us. He raised Jesus from the dead. What else does he do? He gives us gifts. We read in the book of Romans and in 1 Corinthians that the Holy Spirit is the one who gives gifts. He gives good gifts to us. What else does he do? 2 Corinthians 3.17 says he brings freedom. Turn over there with me. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 17. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 17 reads this way. 
It says this, Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. If the Holy Spirit is indwelling your life, then there is a freedom. Can I just submit something to you today? If you're not walking in the full freedom that God wants you to walk in, maybe you need to allow more of the Holy Spirit into your life to make, bring Jesus more alive in you, to bring God the Father more alive in you, to bring the Holy Spirit more alive in you because he brings freedom to us. God the Holy Spirit is alive and well today. What else does he do? The word of God tells us in Romans chapter 15, verse 13, that he gives us hope. Boy, if we ever needed hope, it's now, huh? We need hope. The human race needs hope. We're going to talk some more about that. Here's our second point today. The Holy Spirit is not just very alive and well, but he wants to unite our hearts. God, the Holy Spirit, wants to unite our hearts. Verses 45 and 46 say this. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles. For they heard them speaking in tongues and declaring the greatness of God. Now I want to submit something to you today. Tongues is the language of the Holy Spirit. Tongues is the language of the Holy Spirit. See, speaking the same, let me kind of break this down. Let me explain what I mean by that. Speaking the same language is a huge key in communicating with each other, isn't it? If you and I were having a conversation and I was speaking to you in English, but you didn't speak English, then we wouldn't really be having a conversation, would we? It'd be a one-way monologue. And if you were speaking back to me in Spanish and I didn't speak Spanish, then I'd have a hard time understanding what you were saying. So a real common denominator in understanding each other is that we speak the same language. When I worked in a restaurant, I worked with many people whose first language was Spanish. Now, I did take some Spanish in high school. I took one semester of Spanish, and I wish I would have taken more. But that served as a great foundation for me because many people that I worked with, they spoke Espanol. And I told many of my friends, not just in the restaurant, but at a church I was on staff at where there was a Spanish church, I told the pastor, I said, when we speak primero Espanol, which means first Spanish, Speak first Spanish to me because I want to understand. I want to not just broaden my language horizon, but I want to understand because there's nuances in the English language that's kind of tough to communicate unless you know what an idiom or a phrase is, right? Just like in Spanish, there's inflection, there's ways we say things, there's phrases and sayings. And so, see, many try to understand who God is and what he is saying without being able to understand and speak the language of the Holy Spirit. Now, now, I'm not saying if you haven't been baptized with the Holy Spirit that you're a second-class Christian and you're a second... No, that's not what I'm saying at all. But when we understand that the baptism with the Holy Spirit helps us bring... Uh, helps us gain a deeper understanding of the language of the Holy Spirit and what God is telling us in His Word, the Word takes on all new meaning. We can have great understanding and great revelation, but the Holy Spirit wants to breathe on what we're reading and he wants to change and transform us. See, the Holy Spirit wants to unite our hearts. Let me talk more about this for a minute because I want us to understand this. The Holy Spirit helps us understand what is and isn't being communicated, not just from God's word, but he will help you understand what people are or aren't trying to say as you're having conversations with them. See, we live in a world where a lot of people are saying one thing and they're hoping that we understand what they're saying. Or you might be saying one thing to your spouse and they might be hearing something totally different. I can't tell you how many times that JJ has said something or I've said something and it's not heard the way it's communicated. And we need to stop and step back and say, okay, wait a second, are you hearing what I'm saying? And am I hearing what you're saying? And we live in a world that isn't listening very well. And the Holy Spirit is the one who can bring the unity that our world needs. But like we were talking last week, the world is trying to pursue peace, which is a wonderful pursuit. But if you don't have God the Father, if you don't have Jesus, who is the Prince of Peace, and if you don't have the Holy Spirit, who will help us speak the same language, we're always going to be talking like this and never talking like this and coming together. See... That's why the baptism with the Holy Spirit is so critical. It's the language of the Holy Spirit. It's the language of heaven. Now, look at this. Galatians chapter 3, 
Verses 27 and 20 through 29 say this. It says, for those of you who were baptized into Christ have been clothed with Christ. Watch this. There is no Jew nor Greek, slave or free, male and female, since you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed, heirs according to the promise. Now, let me take a minute and I want to unpack this because I want to make sure we get this. In a world that is looking for peace, we're talking about eating this beautiful peace cake, right? We're using this illustration. At best, we can have a season of peace if God is not in the mix. Because Jesus is the Prince of Peace. So there's a picture of peace of what peace could look like. But there's a deeper place of peace when we have made Jesus the Lord of our life. When we've allowed the Holy Spirit to draw us to Jesus and Jesus then brings us to the Father. And now our name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life as the Word talks about it. See, what the Apostle Paul is telling us here in the book of Galatians He says, if you've been baptized into Christ, you've been clothed with Christ. So I'm wearing a red shirt. If I wasn't wearing a red shirt, you'd just see my chest in all of its awesome muscularness. But I'm wearing this red shirt. And if this red shirt represents being clothed with Christ, then you don't just see all of my awesome muscularness. I can tell you, it's really not that awesome to see me without a shirt on. But that's not the point. The point is this. If this represents being clothed with Christ, what do you see? You see this red shirt that I'm wearing. You see how Jesus has clothed me. And the word of God tells us that if we've been clothed with Christ, we've been baptized into him. And it tells us that there is no Jew nor Greek. Now, it doesn't mean that when I became a Christian, my Italian, Irish, and German roots don't matter anymore because I can't change the color of my, my skin just like a person who's black can't change the color of their skin, just like someone who's Chinese can't change the color of their skin, right? You get where I'm going with this, right? And the Apostle Paul tells us here, if you've been baptized in the Christ, if you have, then you have been clothed with Christ. So people should, should see Jesus. And the word of God tells us, because you have been clothed with Christ, there is no longer, it doesn't matter. Yeah, it's it's not saying that God is colorblind. God is not colorblind. God made you the way he made you. He made you white. He made you black. He sees your culture. And part of what's amazing is God says, okay, because you've made Jesus the Lord of your life, Jesus Christ is the great equalizer. Jesus is the one who makes us equal. And in a world that is screaming for equality, for racial equality, for gender equality, you can't have it unless you come to Jesus. That is not the gospel according to Tim. That's a gospel according to Jesus. You can't have true racial, financial, whatever equality until you come to Jesus. So please come to Jesus today. Let me continue on with this. He even goes on to say, it doesn't matter whether you're a male or female. You are all one in Christ Jesus. Jesus is the great equalizer. Now, is it important that I'm a male? Yes, because there's things that God created me to do as a man. There's things that God created my wife to do as a woman. But Jesus is the great equalizer because we have been baptized into Christ. And because we've been baptized into Christ, we have been clothed with Christ. And he goes on to say, since you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and you are heirs according to the promise. See, what Jesus said a few minutes ago, he said, the Holy Spirit takes of what is mine and gives it to you. Because Jesus says, God has taken what's of his and gives it to me. God wants to get himself into us, but the way we do it is coming in through Jesus, through the work of the Holy Spirit. And there are millions of people around the world who think they can try to figure it out their own way. And just like we looked at last week, our way is not the only way, and oftentimes our way is the wrong way, isn't it? We've got to do things God's way. Let's continue on. Ephesians chapter 4. Verses 1 through 6 says this, Therefore I, this is the the Apostle Paul writing, he says, The prisoner of the Lord, I urge you to walk worthy of the calling you have received with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love. Bearing with one another in love. Bearing with one another in love. Watch this. Making every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope at your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, 
one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. Now, Ephesians, we talked about the time frame last week of the story of Cornelius in Acts chapter 10. And Ephesians was written about 20 years after the events that took place in the house of Cornelius. So now we're about 30 years out from the day of Pentecost. See, what's happening here is Paul is urging Christians to walk worthy of their calling. He says in the very first verse, he says, I'm urging you. He says, if I could get down on my hands and knees as I'm writing this letter to you to beg you, I'm begging you, do everything that you have within your ability to walk worthy of the calling which, which you have received. Walk worthy. Walk worthy of the calling. Don't say you're a Christian and don't, don't act like it. If you're a Christian, then live like a Christian, act like a Christian, talk like a Christian, sound like Jesus, do the things that Jesus would do, because people are looking at us, and the Word of God tells us to walk worthy of the calling that we have received with all humility. Do whatever you've got to do to be humble and gentle. Don't be, no, please don't be, here comes the, one of the biggest oxymorons of all time. Don't be a prideful Christian. Don't be a prideful, I'm such a great, wonderful person. I love Jesus. No, hang on. The word says, to walk with all humility and all gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love. If people do things that you don't understand, ask the questions. Find out why. Don't just assume that they meant this if they meant something different, if they look different than you, if they act different than you, because not everybody had the same upbringing, did we? I grew up in Chicago. You may have grown up in New Hampshire. You may have grown up in California or Canada or a different country of the world. But if we don't understand things, it doesn't mean that we have the right to be prejudiced against them because they're different than us. Remember, Jesus is the great equalizer, and he tells us here through, through the Apostle Paul, he says to walk worthy of the calling with which you have received in all humility and gentleness. And then he says, make every, every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. The unity of the... It doesn't say the unity of peace through the bond of peace. It's the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Keep the unity of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, through the bond of peace. So the Holy Spirit, that's why it is so significant what happened in Acts chapter 10. Because we see the Holy Spirit, Peter even says it. He says they're experiencing what we experienced on the day that we were baptized with the Holy Spirit. They're declaring the greatness of God and they're all speaking in tongues. They're declaring the wonders of God. And that's what is happening here. Paul is continuing and he's saying to walk worthy of your calling. See, the ministry of the Holy Spirit, like we looked at a few minutes ago, is not just to bring unity, but the Holy Spirit is a person. And what he's doing in our life, he is pointing us to Jesus, who gives us everything that God has for us. See, all three members of the Trinity working in tandem together with us, working in that place of unity. How awesome would it be if we as the church of God could really walk together in, this, in the unity of the Spirit? Not just the Spirit of unity. That's fine but walk together in the unity of the Spirit. That's what Paul is telling us here in Ephesians chapter 4. Walking together in the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Because there's one body, doesn't say there's a white church and a black church, and a Mexican church, right? There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope at your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all, through all, and in all. See, so Paul is telling us, please, please, please walk worthy of your calling. I want, I want you to look at one last scripture with me in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. It reads this way. I want to read verse 19. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 19. Let me back up to verse 18. It says this. Well, let's go back to verse 17. Verse 17 says, But anyone joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. Interesting. Here it is again. Anyone joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. Then he goes on to say in verse 18, flee sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the person who is sexually immoral sins against his own body. Don't you know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God with your body. If Paul is urging us to walk worthy of our calling, and if our body 
truly is the temple of the Holy Spirit because we've made Jesus the Lord of our life. Now, I understand the context of this passage is talking about being sexually pure before the Lord and keeping our eyes clear, keeping our heart right, not doing things that God has said, don't do this because it's bad for you and I've got a reason for this and we don't have time to get into all that today. I understand the context is keeping ourselves sexually pure. But when he tells us here that our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, what he's saying is this, yes, be sexually pure, but also be verbally pure. Let your eyes be pure. Let your ears be pure. What are you saying? What's coming out of your mouth? What are you putting into your body? Are there things that are dragging down the temple of God? If, if we're supposed to honor God, and I'm not my own, and verse 20 says, but I was bought with a price to so glorify God with my body. What are the things that I'm doing that aren't glorifying God with my body? Am I cussing? Am I saying things that I shouldn't say? Am I putting things in my body that have no place going into my body? Because the word of God says that I was bought with a price and I am not my own. Even though my name is Tim Versolono, Jesus has put his stamp on my life. And he tells us right here that we are not our own. We were bought with a price and it was a great price, wasn't it? It was a price of Jesus dying on the cross. So I want to ask you, would you take a minute and ask the Holy Spirit just right now, Holy Spirit, what is it that you need me to get rid of? What do you want me to stop doing so I can look more like you? I'm not my own. I've been bought with a price. Maybe you're having relationship troubles with a spouse. Maybe you need to lay down your pride. Maybe you need to actually be quiet and listen to your spouse. Maybe you need to ask the question, how are you doing? What's going on? Help me understand. Maybe you're not getting along with your kids. Maybe you've been trying to get free from smoking or vaping. Or maybe God's pressed you to stop drinking. I don't know what it is. But at the end of the day, you are not your own. I am not my own. I have been bought. You have been bought with a price. And it was a powerfully high price. It was Jesus' death on a cross. What do you need to lay down? Are there prejudices that you need to lay down? Are there mindsets that you need to lay down? Because you've been bought with a price. Jesus didn't just die for white people. Remember, Jesus isn't white. Jesus isn't black. Jesus is Jewish. Jesus probably is olive skin tone because he's from a Mediterranean country, isn't he? See, Jesus died for every single one of us. Every single one of us. We've been bought with the price that he paid. The last sentence says, again, so glorify God with your body. Glorify God. It's not to glorify you. So stop being selfish. Ask the Holy Spirit to help you. I guess he'll help you. I'm not trying to heap condemnation on you. Pastor, I've tried to quit for years. Well, you continue to thank God. Lord, thank you for helping me quit. Thank you. Today's the day. Right now, I'm taking a stand, and the Holy Spirit will help you. See, as the Holy Spirit empowers us, we become more like Jesus, and we have more opportunity to, to respond to who he is, what he is saying. Verse 47 said, Can anyone withhold water and prevent these people from being baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? See, the experience that they had, they were empowered. These brand new Gentile believers, they were empowered just like the Jewish believers were empowered. Because God's not a respecter of persons. Remember, we were in the Word last week. If you missed last week's message, you can, you can go check it out. Peter said, I now see God doesn't show favoritism. It doesn't matter where you came from. It doesn't matter the color of your skin. God does not show favoritism. And we need the baptism with the Holy Spirit so we can speak the same language to really experience the fullness and unity that God wants to experience. Would you take a moment? Would you close your eyes and bow your heads with me? As we come to a conclusion today, I want to ask, maybe you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life. Would you please do that today? If your life needs to change, Jesus wants to change it. Would you just repeat this simple prayer? Would you just say this with me? Father God, I come to you in Jesus' name. I need you to transform my life. I give you my life, all my sin, all my past, all my successes and failures. I give it all to you for you to live in me. Holy Spirit, will you fill me, baptize me, overflow me with your grace, with your power, 
with your life. In Jesus' name, fill me afresh and anew right now. In Jesus' name, I thank you, Lord, for your forgiveness. I thank you, Holy Spirit, for your infilling. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you just prayed that prayer for the first time, my friend, you just made Jesus Lord of your life. And if you just were baptized with the Holy Spirit, I want to encourage you, practice, practice, practice. Practice this new language that God has given you. Because God wants to draw us not just closer to each other, but closer to him. Well, as we come to a conclusion today, uh, perhaps you didn't join us uh, for our live in-person service today. Perhaps you might feel a little bit more comfortable next week. I look forward to seeing you next week. I look forward to seeing you online. If you weren't here, God bless you. We love you so much. 8.30 and 10.30 are our service times. We're coming back together. It's a great time as we're gathering in God's house. I know you're listening to this recorded message right now, but let me tell you what. Jesus loves you very much, and he's Lord of our lives. So we get re- as we get ready to go from this place, again, thank you for your faithful giving. Continue to be on the lookout for everything that is coming up with church. We're starting to get things going again as we're reopening the doors uh, here in the building for live services. So would you stretch your hands this way now and would you receive this blessing? Now, God, I thank you that you don't see the color of our skin as something, as a pre-qualifier for being a recipient of your power, for being a recipient of your love. So in Jesus' name, as we are doers of your word this week and not hearers only, I make this declaration over my brothers and sisters. Church, that you would be the head and not the tail. That you would be above and not beneath. That you'd be blessed and not cursed. And may whatever you set your hands to, may it prosper. In Jesus' name. And if you receive that today, would you shout a big amen? Hi, everybody. Don't sign off just yet. We're going to take a few extra minutes and hear from our missionary who's serving in Southeast Asia, Nicole. Watch this. I am here with Nicole. She is our missionary in Southeast Asia. And Nicole, it is so great to see you. How are you doing? We are so good. We are um, learning what the new norm is here in Southeast Asia. But we are doing well, considering. Good. So would you tell us what, what, what opportunities for ministry have you seen in this uh, current crisis that we're in and ways that you've been able to touch people's lives? So we were invited to go to an area about an hour and a half from here. It's a place where a new pioneering church has been reaching out to an area um, of people who have requested Bible study. And they were asking me, you know, what could we do with the kids this summer? And Aiden's eyes lit up and she's like, soccer camp, mom, a Bible Christian soccer camp. And I'm like, Um, soccer is not very well known here, but the pastor just saw Aiden's excitement. He goes, is this something the youth could join her on? I said, yep. He goes, do you have the materials? And I said, thanks to Real Life Church, we do. <laughs> if you guys remember, um, it was about a year ago that you guys took a, a special offering and provided for ministry materials. And those are here now. Um, and Ada and I were praying over them because we were going to use them for something else, but we were stuck in the U.S. for a while. So I'm like, Lord, you had us buy this. What is this for? And he said, I got gotcha, you, Nicole and Aiden. And the youth were getting excited and they were practicing and getting ready. And then this pandemic came. But we are still going to do this. Um, we don't know the date. But we're still planning. We don't know the place. Well, we know the location, but we don't know how it's going to come together or when. But we know that God does, and we just fall upon that promise and just keep preparing so that we are more than ready. We love Nicole and her family and and believe in what God has called them to do. Uh, We know you're safe there where you're at. We're continuing to lift you in prayer. But I want to ask you, would you pray and say, Lord, what amount would you have me give? So the link is there in the bottom of the screen. Um, And I know that would be a tremendous blessing uh, because Nicole and her family is in a pretty remote area there in Southeast Asia, but uh, you're not far from our hearts. So, okay. well, well, Nicole, thank you so much for taking some time with us today. We're going to take a minute and pray for her before we end our time, but we're not just going to pray for her. We're going to pray for her, her daughter, Aiden, as well. So, uh, so Nicole, why don't you go ahead and get Aiden so we can pray for both of you guys. Hey, Aiden, come here. There you are. Hey, Aiden. <laughs> Hi. It's good to see you. 
Well, church, I just want to ask, would you just uh, take a minute with me? Would you just stretch your hands, church, towards uh, Nicole and Aiden as we lift them before the Lord? Mm -hmm. Uh, Lord, we just want to say thank you again for everything that you are doing uh, with this precious family there in Southeast Asia. We thank you, Lord God, for lives that are being touched. We thank you, Lord God, for your hand of protection that continues to cover Nicole and Aiden. We thank you, Lord God, that in the name of Jesus, that you continue to protect them, keep them safe from any virus. Would you continue to do that over the area that they are in? Lord, we thank you, Jesus, that your name is higher than any virus, than any sickness or illness. First, vision and ideas and creative ways how to minister to the people that you call them there to serve. Lord, we love them. We bless them. Lord, and we pray that as people are giving, that, they, that, that we would not be sparing in our giving, but that we would be generous and abundant in our giving. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen. 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 Well, guys, we love you so much. God bless you. Thank you. <laughs> Have a great day. We love you guys. Thanks for the prayer. And we're praying for you also. God bless.